Okay, we're going to be in John 15, uh, 18 through 27. Before I read that text, I want to remind you of something that Jesus predicted in Matthew 10. He said that uh, brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. So he's speaking to the disciples in Matthew 10. The truth is, all born-again Christ followers have and will continue to face opposition. Um, it may not be death, but it will be uh, a hatred from the world um, that Christ himself received. So today's passage in John 15, 18 to 27, we're going to see that. Jesus talks now to his disciples. Again, we're hours away from the cross, and he reminds them of the reality predicts it of what will come their way here eventually. John 15, 18 through 27, Jesus says, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Uh, before we dig into it, notice that Jesus uses the word if six times in these verses. Jesus knows that there is a 100% chance that they're going to face this persecution. So the if isn't an if that's rooted in, eh, it could possibly happen. Right? It's going to happen. His use of the word if I see grace and love and tenderness there. He is slowly bringing them to the reality of it's going to happen. Because in the beginning of chapter 16, that word if changes to will. So the if is, could be also translated suppose that. Suppose that. Again, bringing them to this realization gently and slowly that they too will face persecution. So it's not an if as if it could possibly happen. No, it's going to happen. It's an if that's gentle in bringing them to the reality that it will, which he does again say in 16. But in these 16, 1 through 4, that word will pops up. So in these verses, we're going to see a reason for persecution in 18 through 21, the result of persecution in 22 through 25, and then the provision in persecution in 26 through 27. The provision in in the midst of persecution. God will provide in the midst of persecution. You can count it, take it to the bank, trust it. Jesus is talking to his 11 disciples. So in verse 18, let's go through it again. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Notice the the power of the word hate here in the midst of over the last several chapters it's all been about love 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 one another the love of god that uh, that the father shows the son the son shows to the disciples the disciples are to show to each other love 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 and then boom he brings hate it's like an atomic bomb here in the midst of this these chapters where he's speaking about love now, the world, of course, we know is the realm of evil controlled by Satan and made up of sinful, wicked men. 
because of their sin nature, right? Because that's what we're born into. It's, it's innate because of the fall. Um, this world is in opposition to God, Christ, his kingdom. And the world is the wicked people that hate Christ and his followers. So now Jesus brings this hard truth. He says, you're going to be hated. The very love that unites a Christian to Christ separates those same Christians from the world. So the very love that's, uh, that joins Christians with their Messiah is the same love that separates those Christians from the world. And that's his point here. Now again, who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to his 11 disciples. They're going to be persecuted. All of them will be persecuted. 10 of them will be killed. The 11th, John, uh, an attempt was made, right? Uh, Emperor Domitian tried to kill John by boiling him in hot oil. That's, I don't know, perhaps it could be worse than being killed. I don't know. At least it would have been over. So the 11 that he's talking to, it's coming. They're being persecuted. So to comfort his disciples in the, in, in the midst of bringing them slowly to the reality of their own persecution, um, he wanted to keep, have them keep in mind the why behind it. There are two reasons why the world hates Christians. And he gives it to us in verse 19 and 21. The first is at the end of 19. They hate Christians, or specifically the 11 he's talking to, and then us through them, because they and us are not of the world, but he chose us out of the world. And then the second reason is because they do not know him who sent Jesus, the Father. So let's talk about the first one. Because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. So we're not of the world, right? Of the world would be all in darkness, blind in our sinful nature, receiving this, the, the, the wrath and punishment that we deserve. But he not just tells them the why that they're not in the world, but that he gives them the how they're not in the world to make it abundantly clear, to show them the reason you're not in the world has nothing to do with your own ability. It, 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 the, the reason you're not in the world is not found in yourself. Why are the 11, and us as well, not in the world? What's he say there? Because he chose us out of the world. The reason they're not in the world doesn't lie in themselves. It lies in the fact that he chose them out of the world. Well, when did that happen? From the beginning, Ephesians 1.4 tells us, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So they hate because we're not of the world. But don't get too prideful. Don't boast about the fact that you're not in the world because it had nothing to do with you not being in the world. The reason you're not in the world had nothing to do with you. It had to do with him. Why? Because he chose you out of the world. Amen? So in reality, the doctrine of election or, or, or predestination is not a prideful, boastful doctrine. It's the opposite. It's the realization that we had nothing to do with it. It is only by His grace that He chose us out of the world. That way, nobody's walking around like this, but everybody's praising Him for His grace and mercy and chose choosing out of the world. It's very clear. I don't think it could be any clearer. Now, before we get to the second reason as far as the persecution that the eleven is going to receive, and then us also, before we do that, Jesus says in verse 20, a servant is not greater than his master. It would be irrational to think that we're going to get better treatment than the one we follow is his point. Jesus, back in chapter 13, called the disciples to follow his example in washing other people's feet, right? other believers' feet. And he will follow my example in the act 
of serving other Christians was the lesson. Now he says, follow my example in the act of suffering. Follow my example in the act of persecution. So he's the model for the serving other believers, washing their feet, and the model for us so that we can expect that a servant's not greater than his master. We're going to receive the same treatment of the one the one who fo- who we follow received, which is his point there. Now, Peter eventually got it because Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2.21, he says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. The message that come to Christ and, and everything will be great, rainbows and butterflies and full bank accounts and Ferraris, is, the, is, is not the message of Christ. It's the, it's the opposite. We see that he says you're going to suffer. Persecution, expect it. So then, in verse 21 now, he says, on account of his name. Now, his name is not simply his name, but his character and everything that he stands for and teaches and every, every part about it. it. It has more than just simply the name. It has everything that he stands for. That's the reason or the justification for the persecution. And then he gives the second one, second reason at the end of verse 21. He says, because they do not know him who sent me. They don't know him. So we see here Christ as the representative of one who sent him, which of course is the Father. Amen? So they don't know the Father. So they reject the representative of the Father And if they reject the representative of the Father, expect that they're going to reject the representative of the representative. Does that make sense? You. But that's why. Because they don't know the Father, therefore they reject the representative. And because they don't know the Father and reject the representative, they're going to reject the representative's representative. You. Expect it. They're dark in their understanding as a result of the Course. So then in verse 22 through 25, he gives the result of persecution. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. So what's the result of persecution for those who persecute? Judgment. Eternal torment. And what is that? That is separation from God. So in the end, they get what they want, right? Separation from God. That's the result of it. But we have to be careful with these verses because some folks might take this verse and say, wait a minute. There is no original sin. We're not born into sin. Look, it says it right there. They say, he says, if I had not come, spoke to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. And then, they, then in verse 24, no one else did. Uh, they would not be guilty of sin. So what does he mean by that? He means specifically the sin of rejecting him in the face of witnessing all of the miracles that he had done. That, there, that is sin right there. It's so evidently clear. Raising dead people from the grave. Miraculously feeding the 5,000 men and all the women and children. Probably 20, 25,000 people total. That's the sin he's talking about. They're still guilty of sin. Amen? So you've got to be real careful. Because he, and he provides clarity in verse 24. If I had not done among them the works. There it is right there. It's clear. He's specifically talking about all of the miracles and things that he did in front of everybody. They reject, and they're guilty of rejecting. Matter of fact, they went even a step further than that because who did they attribute those miracles to? The devil. Right? They said that he cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. 
And that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the unforgivable sin. That's the, so they're guilty of that. So he's not talking about that they're sinless and they're good. No, they're guilty of that specific sin. Amen? We good? Okay. They had right in front of them. He did it right in front of them. All of the miracles, but they yet reject. And that's what he's talking to his 11 about. And they attributed those works to Satan. So in verse 25, he says, but the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. So what is he talking about? So he said, that's an Old Testament quote from uh, Psalms, two Psalms written by David. Psalm 35, verse 19, Psalm 69, verse 4. Where David talks about being hated without a cause. So by making this connection to this this, this uh, text in the, this, these two verses in the book of Psalms, Jesus is fulfilling that. So David's use of it is kind of a type and shadow mentioned for the purpose that when Christ came, he would make the connection and say that it meant its ultimate fulfillment when they hated Jesus without a cause. I mean, think about it. David, was David sinless? No. If it was true for David, how much more true could it be for Christ, who was actually sinless? Does that make sense? So that's so all of those, they reject it, they denied the miracles, they say that I did it out in the power of Satan so that the, pro, the prophecy would be fulfilled that they would hate me without a cause. Jesus' sinlessness, no one else can, can claim, therefore showing that it's truly hating without a cause. And then right there, you, you see another Old Testament prophecy Jesus is making a connection to and showing that it was written hundreds, thousands of years before I came. I'm the fulfillment of that. It's true. And right there, you see the picture of God's sovereignty in all of this. Throughout time, thousands of years, all of these things coming true. That the Lord's sovereign hand is more powerful than then man's will. That his plan and purposes will come to fruition. Man's will will not prevent or stop it. And remember, it was the Lord's will, Isaiah 53 tells us. It was the Lord's will to crush him. Who's the him? Christ. So God is never the passive recipient of the will of the world. He doesn't say, oh, Oh, well, it looks like they got me on that one. I guess I have to bow my knee to the will of the world. No, he is always and precedes and supersedes man's will. It is so clear. Think about a king in a palace. The peasants in the surrounding towns. Do they have the ability to come up and say, I'm going to be friends with the king? Okay, King, okay, you can be my friend. No, it's the opposite way, right? The king says, hey, you can be my friend. He's the one who has the, the sovereign power and the authority to be able to do that. Hmm. So God is never the passive recipient of the will of the world. So they say the result of persecution is separation. They are guilty of sin, specifically the sin of rejecting him in the face of the miracles they saw with his, their own eyes. Now, to the disciples, again, he's going to give them um, the prophecy about the Holy Spirit, the provision in persecution in 26 and 27. 26 says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father... The spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So in the face of persecution, God will provide his spirit. So it is the spirit, because of the spirit's provision, that will enable them to face persecution. I mean, even in, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 10, because it gets even better. Not just face persecution and kind of get through it, but the Holy Spirit is so active in that. They won't just keep quiet or run from persecution, but in love continue to proclaim 
in the face of persecution. Stephen is a good example. Right? Praying for those that are stoning him. And all of our brothers and sisters that have been martyred that burned at the stake or singing praises and proclaiming the gospel while the flames raise. Matthew 10, verse 16. Jesus gives an even clearer picture of how the Holy Spirit will operate in the face of persecution. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So he not only gives us those that he calls to that kind of persecution. He not only gives us them, us if that's what he calls us to, but them, those that are called to that kind of persecution, comfort and peace and joy, but will speak through them, give them the words to proclaim in the face of something intense like that. It's amazing, isn't it? That, talk about a provision. So in the face of the most difficult circumstances that the 10 of the 11, and we'll th throw John in there too, because I'm sure it wasn't fun getting boiled in oil. And in the midst of the oil bubbling around John, the Holy Spirit is proclaiming and speaking to the one who threw him in the oil, the gospel. So not only provide peace and comfort, but literally the words. And so as we move into chapter 16 next week, Jesus will begin to give more clarity around the work of the Holy Spirit in, in chapter 16 and, and those verses there. So in these verses, I'll read it one more time. Jesus is giving the 11 disciples a reason for persecution. They hate you because they hated him. The world hates you because you're not of the world, but you've been chosen out of the world. And they reject the one who sent Jesus and therefore rejecting the representative and the representative of the representative. He gives them the result of persecution, which is separation from God. The very thing that they want, the world will receive. Separation from God forever. And the provision in the Holy Spirit in the face of persecution. Verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world. Why am I not of the world? but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me, hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. There's the clarity for you. Now, But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, it's amazing to see and, and hear of our brothers and sisters who have been persecuted to the same level that these 11 disciples were going to be persecuted from this moment and were persecuted <coughs> from, from today. Um, it's amazing to see the fulfillment of even this prophecy it, that we can look back and see it's true, it's clear, it's evident. And even reading stories from Fox's Book of Martyrs or uh, Killing Christians, Lord, or those other books that detail stories of our brothers and sisters being martyred. 
uh, Lord, we, we know your word is true, and we know that if you do call us to that kind of persecution, that you will fulfill your word and the promises that we just studied. So, Lord, help us to be faithful before and then in the midst of any of that persecution. Let us stand firm on your word, uh, Lord, and use us. For your glory, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.